light switch. Pretty freaking simple concept, really. You got a light bulb, you got electricity, and a switch that allows the electricity to pass through to the light bulb. On, off. On, off. This is exactly how a transistor works in a computer. It's a tiny little gate that opens and closes, allowing electricity to pass through, because that's a binary system. It's either off or it's on, which translates to a one or a zero. Each one or zero is a bit, and eight bits creates a byte, or an ASCII code, that the computer uses to process information. The more of these tiny little switches you have in your computer, the more information it can process. The computer you're watching this video on right now has over a billion transistors in it, which makes it right in line with one of the most accurate predictions in tech and science in the last 50 years. A prediction whose time may be up. Josh Zurek and Alexander Duchesne both asked for a video on Moore's Law. In 1965, Gordon E. Moore was the director of R&D at Fairchild Semiconductor when Electronics Magazine asked if he would write an article about the future of computing. In the article he wrote, he pointed out that the number of transistors they could fit on a chip had doubled every year, and he predicted that that would continue for the next 10 years. And 10 years later, he became one of the co-founders of Intel, and then he predicted that it would double every two years. At this point, it became known as Moore's Law. Along the way, some other factors got wrapped up into Moore's Law, including performance and cost, and in fact, a guy named David House, who was another head guy at Intel, uh, revised it to say that because of the speed of the transistors was improving, that it would actually double, the performance would double every 18 months. And that's kind of what we've been going with ever since. But Moore's Law itself was always about the number of transistors you could fit on a chip, which the industry has kept pace with for 50 years now. I should state real quick that Gordon Moore is still with us. He's 88 years old and sitting on $7 billion of Intel money. So yeah, good show, old chap. This exponential growth in computing power has revolutionized the world and has led futurists like Ray Kurzweil to make pretty outlandish predictions about where things are gonna go in the future. But there's a growing concern that Moore's Law may have reached its limit. In fact, some people say that we're already at the end of it. In fact, research shows that processor speed has kind of leveled out in recent years. So why the slowdown? What are these limits we're running into here? One problem is simply heat. The more processing a chip is doing, the more electricity is flowing through it, and that gets hot. Like, melt your computer hot. The other biggie is size. Because once those gates get down to a certain size, the quantum world starts to take over. Thanks to quantum tunneling, electrons tend to just kind of jump the gap whenever they feel like it. Which is a problem in a binary system where it has to be totally on or totally off. That's a bummer because I'm not getting any younger and I want to see this singularity, people. Come on, chip chop. Luckily, there are some major advancements in the works that might keep this exponential train going. The first one is graphene processors. The reason we use silicon in chips is because of its semiconducting properties, which makes it a really great on-off switch. It also just happens to be one of the most abundant resources in the world, so that's nice and cheap. But graphene transistors could conduct that electricity much more easily and increase clock speed by a factor of 10 or even 100. That means way lower power and far less heat. In fact, in a paper that was published last year from a team of researchers in Moscow and Japan are working on a way to make graphene processors that actually make use of that quantum tunneling effect. There's a link to an article down in the description below, but basically because of the properties of graphene, the electrons tend to kind of group around the edge of it, and then it just takes a slight little nudge for a group of these electrons to tunnel over to the other side of the gate, and that tunneling could actually be the on-off switch. Graphene, by the way, if you don't know what graphene is, it's, it's a one layer, one atom thick layer of carbon atoms that are arranged in a hexagonal pattern. And it's really awesome. It's got a lot of really cool properties, but it's also really expensive to make right now. So interesting stuff, but until we can get to where we can make graphene as cheap as one of the most abundant materials in the planet, it's still a ways in the future. Another idea is three-dimensional chips. A team at Stanford has created a three-dimensional chip that uses carbon nanotubes to stack memory on top of the processor. That way it's all compacted into one place. And they say this makes it a thousand times faster than a normal computer chip. The next one is molecular transistors. In 2009, the first molecular transistor was created, which used a molecule of benzene suspended between two gold contact points to serve as the on-off switch. Another was created in 2015 that actually had the ability to transfer only one electron at a time, but it has to be super cool to work, so not really viable in mass computing. Still, to have a single molecule control the gate is a pretty awesome idea. Next up is photon transistors. What if instead of using electrons to do the on-off switch, you used photons? 
little particles of light. In 2013, scientists at MIT created the first optical transistor, which used beams of light instead of flows of electron to make the on-off switch happen. And it was really cool they were even able to send only one photon over at a time, but this is still very primitive in the amount of information that they can process with it, so that's still in the future right now. And you can't do a list of future computer technologies without mentioning quantum computers. This deserves a video all its own. Basically the reason you hear so much about quantum computing is because it would be a gigantic leap forward in how we process information in computers because we'd be getting away from the binary system completely. The reason is because in the quantum world, you have both on and off, but then on and off simultaneously. So there's actually three states. So theoretically, the computer would be able to run parallel processing, doing multiple calculations at the same time, which allows for a lot faster, especially data, uh, encryption and stuff like that. The, the research that I showed was a little bit old, so this might not be true anymore, but what I read was that the most, the biggest calculation that they've done so far on a quantum computer was, was figuring out three times five equals 15. What's cool about it though, is that they were able to do that using only five atoms. They took five atoms and were able to do a multiplication table out of it, basically. That's super cool. All right, so now we're starting to get into some really weird territory, but one idea that's been floated around is protein computers. Yeah, did you know you can make a computer out of a chicken breast? You can't. Don't listen to him. Researchers at Lund University in Sweden were able to make a working computer the size of a book that uses proteins to do its calculations in a parallel fashion, which is something you're going to be hearing a lot more of. Parallel processing is a big deal. It worked and it used far less energy. It's really kind of mind-bending. There's a link downstairs about it. And last but not least, DNA computers, like DNA. Now DNA's been floated around as a possible data storage mechanism for a while now, and it kind of makes sense when you think about it, because what is DNA but a place to store genetic information? The cool thing is that DNA consists of two different types of base pairs. Dog. There's adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. And they form base pairs, only those two with each other. That's a binary system. So using gene sequencing techniques, a team at Harvard in 2012 was able to put 700 terabytes on one gram of DNA. With our current technology, that would weigh 150 kilograms. So DNA might be the perfect information storage solution. It's super dense, it lasts forever, and it's super abundant. It's in every living thing. So yeah, cool storage solution. But what about computing power? Leonard Alderman first proposed DNA processors back in 1994, and he even built one that was able to do some rudimentary calculations, but it was very primitive and required people to be involved. It wasn't anything practical. More recently, a team at the University of Rochester created logic gates out of DNA strands. Still pretty primitive, but a cool step in the right direction. Once perfected, they think that a teardrop-sized DNA computer would be as powerful as all the computers on Earth put together right now. Computers like this that work at the molecular level could lead to nanomachines that we could inject into our bodies to repair tissues, to improve brain function, and do all kinds of things we probably can't even imagine right now. Who knew the most powerful computer in the world was inside us all along? Now these are some exciting potential technologies. Unfortunately, most of them are still pretty far in the future, so it still looks like we're gonna have a slowdown to Moore's Law. But while Moore's Law may be coming to an end, we need to pause and reflect on just how important it is. Because it was never really a law, like gravity is a law or thermodynamics is a law. There was no inevitability to this. This only happened because engineers and scientists worked year after year grinding out new innovations and new ideas to keep pace with this prediction. Now it's possible that materials improvements and whatnot would have caused this same exponential growth over the years, but I think there's an argument to be made that this arbitrary prediction was able to focus everybody's attention on these goalposts that were set up along the way. And let's not forget that the guy who made the prediction also just happened to be the head of the biggest chip manufacturer in the world. That helps. But I do think those expectations are important. You know, futurists like Ray Kurzweil, they're often ridiculed for their fantastical visions of the future, but those predictions lay down a path for us to follow. It gives society a focus and creates a self-fulfilling prophecy that moves everybody forward. We will get to the moon by the end of the decade. We will double computer power every two years. We will create artificial superintelligence. Having a roadmap matters, whether as a whole society or just an individual in your own life. So draw your roadmap. See where it takes you.
So what do you think? Do you think Moore's Law is coming to an end? And if so, which one of these technologies would you like to see? Talk it up in the comments. There was a lot of research I had to do for this, and I want to thank Matt Herring, who actually helped me out quite a bit with this. And uh, I want to point out that there's a lot of links in the description to stuff that you'll get a lot more context to what I'm saying. I kind of skimmed over a lot of things, so definitely go down there and check out some of those links. If this is your first time here, I hope you enjoyed it. Welcome, and consider subscribing, because I do videos just like this every Monday. And if you love this kind of stuff and you really want to support this channel, Please, as always, uh, check out patreon.com slash answerswithjoe where you can support the channel and get exclusive perks and other video series that I don't show anywhere else. It's some cool stuff there. So with that, you guys go out, have an eye-opening week, and I will see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.